Hey y'all, welcome to our fifth episode of our CNS alumni video series where we interview prominent uh, CNS alumni that have had successes in a number of different fields. My name is Socket. I'm Richard. And we're your host from the Natural Sciences Council. Our guest with us today is Mr. Brian Snotty. Brian, could you introduce yourself for us? Sure, my name is Brian Snotty. I'm a UT alum of 1996 that I graduated a uh, degree in chemistry from the College of Natural Science. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we know your time is really valuable, so we really appreciate you um, taking the time out of your schedule to you know, meet with us and um, talk about your experiences. That being said, do you mind if we go ahead and jump into the first question? Absolutely, let's do that. All right, um, can you tell us a little bit about your time at UT, like uh, what your major was, what you were involved in, et cetera? Sure, I started off in the College of Natural Sciences. Um, initially, I, when I began, I was the uh, chemistry major. I, but at the time, I actually intended to double major in chemistry and biochemistry. And um, I wanted to become an astronaut. And so I was going to go, go join the Air Force and I and, uh, had my chemistry major and I'd go into the astronaut corps. Uh, typically to do that, you need to get uh, into one of the, the flying programs or something way. I just never made it into the flying aspect. My vision wasn't good enough. And uh, frankly, you know, my grades probably weren't nearly at the, the highest levels that required to be an astronaut either. But that's sort of where I was, I, um, but I, I enjoyed that, did it for four years. Um, and then in 96, when I graduated, um, I went off to the Air Force out of the ROTC program as a second lieutenant. I started off in, uh, in Germany. My first duty assignment was in Frankfurt, Germany. And that's how I began my, my professional career. Yeah, um, thank you for sharing uh, about your experiences here at UT. Uh, it sounds interesting that you're, you know, able to hone in on a goal and you felt determined to achieve that goal. And that kind of led you to the Air Force, which is something I kind of wanted to touch on. Uh, so you did, uh, after graduation, you did go to the serve in the Air Force as an officer. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about how your time in the military uh, maybe shaped you? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that uh, I should say this is, it's sort of in retrospect, but one of the things that I believe that most students will find is that once they get into the professional environment uh, and they're out there and they're working and, and um, they begin to really appreciate the academic setting, that there's a, a great deal of, of freedom. There's the, the luxury of time and a component of, of curiosity and the permission and the allowance for, um, for failure that you probably wouldn't be able to experience necessarily uh, in, the, in the military. For instance, I did global war operations. I did, uh, I was the transportation officer when I started off in, in Germany. Um, we just don't have the opportunity to make a mistake when you have a $300 million aircraft on the, on the ramp, right? So, you know, but in the lab, in chemistry lab, when uh, with a, a small explosion and it, my, my experiment blew up, it's not that big a deal. It's not, you know, at the end of the day, I learned a we all ducked and covered and do some cleanup, but there's just a whole different world. But one thing that I think that we, that you really do when you, when you get into that environment, professional environment, is you begin to think back and reflect and to enjoy the learning that you've done and the ability to be around others that are very dedicated, uh, passionate students and that really um, just uh, were, were really, um, and in some ways, not, not altruistic or, or, or um, but really had just a joy about it. And that's why I can describe is uh, oftentimes in the work environment, we're not necessarily as uh, as joyful because we have a lot of things going on and we're trying to really hit the, the bottom line of the targets, uh, whether you're talking about military targets or we're talking about actually some type of goals and targets. And so we take advantage of, I would, I would encourage everybody to take as much advantage as possible of uh, the, the time that they have at UT. First and foremost, I want to say thank you for your service. Um, you know, it's fantastic that you had the opportunity to serve in the military and you did so for um, quite a while. Um, that's really amazing. So um, again, thank you for your service and thank you for your response. You know, um, I think you brought up a really good point about how uh, the educational environment gives you such a um, amazing place to keep trying things and, uh, you know, doing what you're passionate about. And I feel like maybe not as many CNS students do that as they should because they feel kind of pigeonholed in certain things. So um, thank you for, you know, talking about that a little bit. That being said, I do want to spend uh, just another minute on um, your military career. In the time that you served, 
did you have any experience that, you know, really sticks out as something that was really impactful to shaping who you are today? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can tell you, one of the things that happens in the military is oftentimes you're given um, a large amount of resources and a very short window to go and accomplish something. And, and frequently that's a lot like an experiment, except this time the experiment needs to generate some sort of tangible results. And so, you know, I was, I think this was probably my uh, uh, second year in the military and, and one of the generals came in and said, well, hey, we, we have, um, I was the passenger terminal, what they call the OIC, which is the officer in charge. And so I was the person in charge of about 75 personnel and a terminal that cost about $5 million to, to build at the time. And it was significantly more valuable than that, uh, but it was on the other side of the Frankfurt Airport, the International Airport. And we were moving towards, um, this was back in, oh, 1998. This was well before uh, 2001 and 9-11. Uh, we, we were working on a secure terminal facility. And so the, the general came in and said, well, hey, I'm gonna give you, uh, here's $6 million. I want you to figure out how to make this passenger terminal secure. Essentially, an experiment that we need to take on, but we can't fail, right? We get, we get, the, get these resources, and then you start to learn what are the aspects of security? How do you um, secure things? How do you make sure luggage is secure? How do you make sure people get in and out of the terminal? How do you make sure that uh, your, any of the entrance, the egress and ingress points are, are covered? And then also, how do you make sure that you're able to detect for, um, for explosives and things of that nature? And so. Uh, this is one of the areas where my knowledge of chemistry actually comes in into play. You know, we had the uh, device called a, a, the barium ion scan, which helps detect uh, for explosive residue. And so you'll still see that uh, where they take the swab and they swap down some uh, luggage. But I have some pretty pretty good knowledge of that, and I want to thank you know uh, Dr. Lottie and other chemistry um, because that knowledge actually helped me make determinations as to what equipment, what types of scenarios we're gonna be effective to actually achieve and accomplish our goal. And so these are the ways that, that things, they'll line up and you won't see it and you, you don't really realize that that knowledge that you're learning right now is gonna be useful later, but uh, frequently it is. And, you know, that's really amazing, especially the fact that, uh, you know, you're able to apply your degree in that way. I feel that, um, you know, a lot of students find it difficult to think of ways that they actually apply their degree in the real world. So the fact that you were able to do that in something so different, right, is really amazing. Um, that being said, though, um, I do kind of want to move on to the next question. And that's, um, so after serving active duty for about five years, uh, we know you returned to school to begin to pursue a career in law. Right. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what led you to that path and the progression of your career to where you are today? Sure. That, I think the, one of the things I found pretty uh, instructional, intuitive, and also just sort of natural to me was just being a lifelong student that the curiosity that you that starts at UT and that is founded through the College of Natural Sciences or in being just being a chemistry major where you spend a lot of time experimenting and learning and and driving forward to obtain knowledge of that which we don't know yet right and that encouraged me to go back to school and to study law practice I wanted to learn more and more about that stuff, those things, those topics that I didn't know. I wanted to make sure that I was continuing to expand my mind and to continue to challenge myself. Um, and at the time that I actually left the Air Force, I just made, I think, company grade officer of the year for my command. Um, so it was quite a, a feather in my cap, but it was also a good transition moment. I, I could have gone on and had a long career, but also felt that I had a longing to go back to school and really to, to further my own education. And I wanted to, to push myself uh, just a little bit further because you know that's what, that's what Longhorns do. We, we find ways to push the envelope. Yeah, um, it's really cool to see that you're just so dedicated to constantly learning something, you know, and I really appreciate the mentality of, you know, like always being a student, uh, whatever, you know, field you are in. Um, I kind of wanted to shift gears a bit and ask, you know, if you had any major bumps or hardships along your path, um, and if you did, how did you overcome them? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that, that takes place when you go back to school after you've gotten out, especially particularly if you're going to grad school, is you get a little rusty, 
right? So you, you haven't gone through and done the, the types of studying that you have done uh, as rigorously as you may have in the, while you were still in school. And so um, I can still recall transitioning from the Air Force, I believe it was August uh, the 31st of 2001. So that was my last date on active duty at the time. Uh, had I extended just a, you know, a few days there, I would likely have still been in the military because 9-11 happened. But I can recall that um, at the time I was going back to school, I had uh, uh, some exit physicals and they, they discovered that I needed to have some a knee surgery. So I had that done. And then I flew down to Houston where I started law school and I started on crutches and I had to you know, crutch around the campus with my backpack on and, and the law books are pretty heavy. They're, they're six, 7,000 pages a piece and you need to read just about every page of them from front to back if you want to be successful. And so I can still recall being, you know, in the first class and particularly, you know, one of the contracts and we have our, our teachers, teacher assistants, they call them PAs and I'm reading this, this class and we're talking about you know, law and contracts and it seems incredibly complex. You know, some of them, there's an offer and acceptance, consideration, exchange and mutual assent. And these are all the factors. And each case is, these are distillations of the actual whole case. Most of these cases are, are 50 or 60 pages long, which you read a distillation of maybe 100, 120 cases within a case book. And I said to the um, a TA, I never, never forget, I was sitting there talking to, to Eric, and I said, man, this is really hard. And he said, no, this isn't hard. It's just hard work and you have to know the difference. And then it dawned on me, you know, it comes back to you that sort of muscle memory that, yeah, you, you had already taught me how to do hard work. I don't do that. Let's get it done. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a really great like point to hammer it on where it's, uh, it's not hard, but it's hard work. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of students, especially now, uh, are realizing, you know, that there is so much work they have to put in to get those results. But if they put it in, you know, they will hopefully be able to find a successful path like you did. Um, and, um, I really want to thank you for sharing that, um, experience with us. Um, that being said, we know after you graduated, you began a law career and you were able to practice in a variety of different roles. Um, and we found them actually to be really interesting. We we're wondering, could you maybe tell us a little bit about what your path looked like, uh, right after you graduated from law school and what drew you to all the different fields that you got a chance to work in? Well, I think, you know, I, I was I have to go all the way back to high school, but in high school, I was a, a debater. I went to Baylor debate camp and I used to, you know, you do this sort of the speed and the cross examination debate. Um, and so I was sort of fascinated by litigation. I thought that, that would, you know, one, it's there's a, a sort of the Perry Mason or the Matlock moments we see in court. Um, but those aren't really, that's not real life. The real moments that, that are out there are, it's a lot of dedication, a lot of work behind the scenes, a lot of analysis and critical thinking. And so if you enjoy that, and I did, I enjoyed that very much uh, as a student at UT, uh, whilst getting my degree in chemistry, then I recognized the parallels and how that dynamic literally flowed all the way into law practice. And this is gonna sound a little bit strange, but you know, I did um, start off uh, with a small firm my first year, just working a little bit and I went and became a law clerk for a federal judge before I moved over to a large firm, uh, Baker Botts, and did intellectual property practice for several years there in intellectual property litigation. But the thing to recognize is there's a direct sort of a corollary between practice of law and the practice of chemistry. Um, if I'm trying to enforce a contract, a contract has certain elements and these elements can be put together and when it's under the right conditions, it can drive a result. That's fundamentally not anything different than how somebody would make water if they had hydrogen and some oxygen, apply some heat, and then you're gonna make water when you get the right combination of molecules. And the world of law, if I have a contract, I take somebody's offer, I get an acceptance from a responding party. There's some exchange of mutual consideration, money for a car, say, and now you contract formed that the parallels are there, you understand that the structural dynamics are exactly the same. It's just that one element is an element of law, the other is an element of chemistry. Uh, yeah, 
thank you for, you know, kind of guiding us through your path and, you know, after law school. And I think it's really cool and interesting to, for you to draw that parallel. And it's nice to see that, you know, whatever you learn in university or in the College of Natural Sciences can still stay relevant, even if it's like a kind of a different field like law. So um, I appreciate your knowledge on that and wisdom on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll you, you know, if I can, the other thing that I think that folks fail to understand that sometimes is that just because you learn one topic in one area doesn't mean it won't have more universal applicability, right? So um, that wasn't the only time I used chemistry. I, later on in my, my career, I used chemistry in order to fall back on using chemistry as well, uh, even in law practice or in other relevant situations. But not only is it the chemistry, it's also the camaraderie and the relationships that you build at UT. Because then I had some friends that had gone on to do different types of work. And maybe I needed to know about financial, or maybe a chemical mechanism that I wasn't really sure about, but we were doing the same type of study. So those relationships and those connections, they come back to, to sort of haunt you in a good way. So you wanna make sure that the knowledge comes back and it's useful. But just as useful are the connections that we form and the, those deep connections, particularly with our, our other classmates and even with our professors. Yeah, that's a really great point. And it's been echoed many times, you know, by other professionals we've interviewed, just how important it is to, you know, build that network and how you can learn, continue to learn from that network even after college, you know? So I think that's a really good relevant point you brought up and it's good advice. Um, um, I kind of wanted to shift or move on into kind of the present. So, you know, currently you're the director of civil rights at the Texas Workforce Commission. Um, can you talk a little bit about, a little bit about the commission, uh, your role, and why you pursued civil rights division uh, specifically? All right, let me let me so I can go in, in reverse of this. I'll tell you that one, I did not necessarily pursue the role of of the, being a division director of the civil rights division. Um, and then, and in fact, a lot of what took place happened as a, just a consequence of being um, available and ready at a moment in time and, and being able to seize and, and take advantage of the opportunity. So I'll, I'll say that you know, the university, one of the things that I think is very, very critical for everybody to understand is that the, the training that we go through to learn information is about just learning the information. It's also about learning how to learn and how, learning how to continue to learn when you have information that you may not understand or even when you have information that you do understand but you're trying to figure out some unique way to do something with it. That's life. That's what we, what we get, what I get paid to do is to solve problems every day. I mean, yes, technically my, my, my title is director, but what I am fundamentally, pay to do is to take difficult problems that are complex and then to somehow take those problems that are complex and to be able to simplify them, distill them into the, the more simple components so we can now address those problems and then shift uh, resources and be able to accomplish the results and, and the goals that we wish to seek. So now, now saying that at least at least a framework for, for Texas Workforce Commission is where I currently work. The Workforce Commission is a, an agency within the state of Texas that is, you know, hugely impactful right now, especially during COVID. If, if people have been watching the news, you understand that we are on the news. Um, but we also have been very impactful in, in providing uh, unemployment insurance benefits to millions of Texans, uh, passed through billions of dollars for those that are affected by COVID. In addition to that, we also have adult education literacy programs in addition to child care um, subsidies and, and many other programs for skills development that we work with other colleges. Um, one of the other core functions we have is, is civil rights. And in the civil rights division, you know, what we do there is we really want to ensure uh, we work under two aspects of law, which is fair housing and also implementation of equal opportunity, equal employment opportunity. But on a more fundamental basis, what we do is we make sure that people have and ensure that they are recipients of dignity at home and in the workplace. And that's the more fundamental sort of motto that we sort of hold dear. Um, you know, ideally, uh, and this is sort of the BHAG goal, is what we'd like to do is ensure that 
within the state of Texas that nobody experiences discrimination in employment or housing. Now that's, that's probably not technically possible, but that's certainly what we'd like to do. It's a huge goal, but if you don't think big, then you won't be able to achieve big because you aren't actually dreaming about the things that you want to have accomplished. And so it's one of the things that, that goes back to UT is, um, I, I think it's, it can be a mistake for folks to get there and to stop dreaming, right? So if I get to the, on campus, let's say I want to be a doctor, um, it's okay to be a doctor. It's okay to want to go into med school. I mean, it's not better than okay, it's great, you know. I love, we need a lot of doctors right now during COVID. But at the same time, I think folks need to recognize that there are a lot of things that one can do with a degree from the University of Texas, particularly from uh, the College of Natural Sciences. Um, and not to necessarily, it's okay to have a good idea because we need to have some pretty good um, waypoints for otherwise we'll get lost where we're going in life. But just because I'm headed to Dallas doesn't mean I don't want to stop in Waco. Right, I may decide I want to go there and, and, and visit and, and see something or go to a shop um, that I saw on the news or, or whatever. So the, 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 the idea, the real notion is, is to make sure that we have a good fixed target of what we'd like to hit and where we want to go, but we don't want to get so focused in and tunnel visioned on that, that we forget to take in all the other things that are around and or be able to take advantage of any of the opportunities that can present themselves along the way. And so that's, to get back to your question, that's kind of how I got into the Civil Rights Division. I actually started off, um, this was back in, in June of 2018. I met with the chairman at the time of the commission and they brought me over from the Texas Department of Agriculture as a, a staff attorney. And I started off basically drinking out of a fire hose, learning everything about um, the Workforce Commission because I had no idea about the unemployment insurance program and a lot of things. And so I went through all the manuals, I went through the programs and we have probably the 25 or 30 different programs that we offer to the public and they're necessary to ensure um, continuous prosperity and a good economic function for the state of Texas. But, you know, doing that for a while and then um, I applied for a different position uh, at one point. I didn't get that position, but one of the interviews uh, noticed that I was kind of driven and I had this sort of idea of how to be more dynamic and proactive. And I ended up with an assistant director role for about three or four months uh, as a civil rights division before applying to be the, the permit director. And that all happened, um, let's say I was permit, main permit director last September. So that happened in a very short window of time. What I can say is all of that happened though, because I had been able to take advantage of the moments and the opportunities to learn the things that I need to learn in a very rapid fashion to put them together and then be able to do something fruitful with it, which is precisely how we and what we do when you're a student at University of Texas, taking all these different classes, we're putting it all together, and then we take that information. And now the combination of all that study allows you to do something new, you know, or as we say, we go out and we change the world. I think. Um... That's absolutely amazing, you know, uh, talking about the way that you um, didn't really come looking for this position, but it really found you mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, how you've, you know, um, worked harder, you know, you've been able to use that passion for like learning that we talked about a little bit earlier and uh, continue to learn and explore the field and um, get acquainted with it and now be the director of that division, which is very impressive. So, um, yeah, that's just fantastic to hear about. That being said, I did kind of have a follow up question that I wanted that I was wondering about. Um, you talked about how whenever you came into this role and you joined at first, you had to read through and learn all of this stuff, right? All the stuff that was associated with um, Civil Rights Division of the Texas Workforce Commission, right? So um, throughout all of your time, right, as you were transitioning through different roles, so working in agriculture before coming to the Workforce yeah. Commission, and I think it was like a chiropractor's office before that, is, or chiro Texas General Council for the board. General Council. Yeah. Um, so like for all of those things, did you have to go through a process where you had to relearn or start learning all of the stuff and like regulations specific to that? And how did that kind of work for you? Over and over again. Uh -huh. So this is, you have to have this sort of perpetual learning mindset. Um, it's very, it, it's very easy once you get into the habit of always learning. And it's also very rewarding because what I've learned 
over time begins to build on itself and actually becomes a force multiplier. So I, I couldn't do what I do now without having had the experience of being an assistant attorney general when I came back to Austin and uh, I guess that was 2011. And I spent time there, you know, representing 11 or 12 different agencies and having arguments from in courts from the district courts up to the Texas Supreme Court, up, up to the, even up to the uh, Fifth Circuit uh, down in, in New Orleans. And so, but each one of those dynamic experiences contributes to the whole. You know, so I, I've drawn from that. I've drawn from my experiences a general counsel for the Texas Board of Chiropractic Examiners, because then you learn about rulemaking. You learn about um, the processes for how we go through the legislative session. And then uh, even with the uh, Texas Department of Agriculture, a lot of the things that we do and one of the ways that we're successful is by partnerships. And frequently, most of our partnerships and a lot of the, the money that flows into Texas are federal partnership dollars, whether that's uh, the FDA or it's T. Uh, the Energy Association, or in my case, where we work with HUD and EEOC in the uh, Civil Rights Division. Well, that's, um, again, really amazing. And I think that idea of perpetual learning is definitely something that's daunting to students now, especially as they're like struggling through like OCHEM, uh, like uh, I know we are. But um, the point is, I understand how that can be really tough, but I'm glad that you kind of figured out that that's what works and you've been so successful following um, you know, that kind of path and strategy. That being said, though, I do kind of want to uh, move on to kind of a broader view of everything so far. So you've had a long and storied career since completing your undergrad, right, progressing to the military, law school, and then eventually working for a number of different, or working in a number of different roles before landing where you are now. So I guess the real question is, looking back, are there any particular um, career experiences that are particularly meaningful or impactful to you? You know, I think one of the first things that I think that was really impactful and meaningful to me was particularly when you have a chance to give back. You know, I, um, I remember when I, I first argued some of my first cases as a young assistant attorney general with the office of the attorney general. And when you stand up in court and you say, to the judge that on behalf of the state of Texas, that's a very sort of a powerful statement that you're making. You're saying that on behalf of the 26 odd million or 27 million, whatever the number is now, people in Texas, I am here to articulate what is right, what is the law. And I don't, I don't know if there's ever a feeling that, that you get like that, where you're really, um, because that component is what it's really all about in my mind is I'm serving a greater cause. I'm serving something greater than myself and that no matter what else, whatever else I do, I can never get to do anything better than serving other fellow people. You know, that sort of extension came as a result, it started off anyways with in the, in the air force where you serve the nation, the country, but serving Texas, there's something unique and, and, and wonderful about that because you know, I attended the University of Texas because I grew up in Northeast Texas in a little town of Longview, went to a little school called White Oak. Um, all my friends, or a good portion of my friends live in Texas. You know, some of them went to the, the other school, which won't be named. But, uh, you know, and so when you, step, when you step up and you say that you're here on behalf of Texans, that's something that's um, rather unique. The other thing I would mention is, um, I think that Texas is a very special place. It's a very uh, unique and it's very, it's, it's itself is storied around the world. You know, I can remember being in, in Europe and um, you know, some soldiers would may go out and, and meet other folks that are from another country, maybe in Germany. A lot of people say they're American, right? I'm well, from the United States, I'm from the United States. When you got to the people from Texas, they said, we're from Texas. We didn't say we're from United, we're Texans. And so, the University of Texas, we're, we're the same way. When somebody asks, what university did you attend? I attended the University of Texas at Austin. We make things happen. We change the world. You know, that's a very, a lot of pride that we take in that because we understand that um, we have taken on the, the mantle and the responsibility of doing bigger things in ourselves. Um. Yeah, uh, 
thank you again for you know your insight and just i guess inspiring you know current uc students you know about the the mindset that we should all have you know to just advance ourselves and you know advance others and just help just the community uh, you know so i uh, kind of want to move on to one of our final questions um if you could do it all over again uh would you choose the same path for yourself and uh if not what would you change oh wow this is I, I think that if I could do it all over again, you know, hook them horns all the way. No doubt about it, right? I'm, I'm definitely, I love the university. Um, I, I can't imagine doing it any other way. I think though I've given myself more permission to fail, right? I've, and, I've, and this is something that I tell my team currently right now. Um, although, you know, failure in government, I told me, quote unquote, is typically not really what people want to hear. But fail, I've heard the term is, you know, a first attempt in learning. So it's just a first attempt in learning. So if I fail, I'm not a failure. It doesn't mean that. And so I would have given myself more permission to try different things. I may have tried a different, um, maybe a different major. I may have experimented more going to some other colleges and taking some other classes and really just getting a, a really good sense of what was it that really excited me personally, what, what spoke to my heart and how do I get the knowledge and how do I get the, the um, speak, the, how do I strengthen those core things that are within me that are going to allow me to go out and to make a difference in the world? Because at the end of the day, I think it's all about everybody being uniquely themselves and then having the opportunity to express that uniqueness through their own talents. And part of that is being able to make uh, and, and be able to use the freedom to, to take uh, and make those choices and then to have those choices then actually propagate into successes later in life. You know, I think that's an amazing piece of advice and just so um, important for college students to hear because I think fear of failure is definitely a, a fear held by most college students. And, you know, they're so worried about the potential for failure that a lot of times it limits what we uh, even attempt to try. Um, and I think it's really important, just like you said, um, to, you know, do what you can, do what you want to do. And if you fail, it's just a first attempt at learning. And, it's you know, the first attempt at learning. And, and the thing is, is, you know, um, one of the things I think that we may not really be thinking about, but when I got out of UT back in 1996, when I started, there was no internet, technically per se. There was a a lab system that had the, what they call the data list system where you went in and you typed uh, on the Mac and people were in the room and the intranet, not the internet, but the intranet, you could type around the room and have a conversation in a chat chat box. And that was considered groundbreaking back then. That was, oh, wow, we can, I can talk to somebody on the other side of the room without actually talking to them. By the time I'd gotten to the Air Force in 96, I could email across the ocean back and forth there. Right? and do so with uh, pictures and regularity of speed that you just couldn't do before. And at the time, I think they were still using uh, pagers. And then by the time I got back to the States in 2000, there were cell phones and then cell phones propagated to smartphones. And then we've gone now from that to uh, internet everywhere to use of aug you know, augmented reality and artificial intelligence. And we use these things more on a daily basis and it's a form of learning and a form of integration of the technology and the learning that most folks haven't really thought about, but they're definitely and necessarily impacting who they are, what they're doing, and how they're going to accomplish their goals and tasks in the future. So I'm a really big proponent of this continuous sort of learning because we never really get to stop learning. It's just whether or not one wants to take the conscious uh, decision, make the conscious decision to take advantage of the, the learning moments and opportunities. And again, that's just another amazing piece of uh, advice, which kind of actually segues into our last final question. Um, I know you've given us some really good advice and a lot of your stories you know, have been fairly inspiring. And I feel like a lot of students hopefully will be able to draw from them. But that being said, do you have any final parting words uh, for UT students, like words of advice or just anything, honestly? Well, you know, one of the things that I often say is I've been to some of the UT, the career fairs, um, 
and and I think this is very very important is I think that folks need to know that you have to have a purpose for what you want to accomplish. And when I, when I tell people that, I almost tell them to write it down, that you can never succeed beyond a purpose for which you are willing to surrender, right? So you can never succeed beyond the purpose for which you're willing to surrender. And what that means is, is these are things that I'm willing to do almost reflexively because I bought into it so wholeheartedly, my heart, my, my mind, the core of my, my fiber and being says that this is what I'm meant to do. And when you, when you, when you find that purpose, then you're going to, you're going to find success. And so part of that is just really about giving yourself permission, giving yourself freedom, freedom to succeed, freedom to take advantage of an opportunity, freedom to fail. All those things will eventually lead to um, everybody's own measure and level of success. Yeah. Um, again, amazing piece of advice. Um, I'm really hoping a lot of students will be able to draw from it. I feel like at least I will. Um, but that being said, that was our last question. Um, we really, really, really appreciate you taking the time to come out here. Um, all the stories, all the experiences uh, you were able to talk about with us have been absolutely amazing and eye-opening. And um, like I said before, I really hope uh, they work to inspire um, the students of uh, the College of Natural Sciences. Richard, do you have any last minute closing notes? Um, just thank you, Brian, for being here and appreciate your time. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Second and, and Richard, for inviting me. Certainly, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to, to give back to the university. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's just a few moments of uh, maybe small bits of clarity mm -hmm. and inspiration that I, that I can hopefully provide and some little nuggets of things that I've experienced over time and, and maybe just a tad bit of wisdom, uh, if I can be so presumptuous. No, there definitely was more than just a tad bit of wisdom. Um, but that being said, again, we really, really appreciate your time. Uh, to our audience, oh, thank y'all uh, for tuning in uh, this episode. Uh, be sure to stay on the lookout for the uh, next um, episode. And as always, hook them. Hook them, Orange.